All right, guys and girls. Uh, what I did was I split period eight into two different videos to try to best support uh, you all and your uh, knowledge or uh, in some cases lack thereof. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just talk about all the important stuff of period eight domestically here at home. Uh, I think some of the confusion for period eight, which is logical and makes total sense, uh, is that it kind of jumps all over the place, right? We're talking about Vietnam one day and then protests at Kent State the next day and then Laos and then Nicaragua the next day. So uh, what I did was I put domestic policies, so you know consumerism and conformity and the civil rights movement and the Great Society and, and all that stuff together chronologically speaking and then I'll come right back and I'll record the exact same period, the same presidents, the same time period, but just for foreign policy cold war. So, you know, we'll hit like the Cuban Missile Crisis and then the Vietnam War and then um, the same type of things, the same president, same people, same players, but just on foreign policy. So my, my thinking is that should help you guys delineate uh, both separate sets of policies and then help you layer them together uh, in terms of what's happening at the same time in American history. So if I'm right, great. If I'm wrong, well, I'm used to it. Uh, as a refresher, period 8 is worth 15% of your final test, so it matters just as much as period 7. Uh, so make sure that you really, really, especially since our, our test scores were a little low on period 8, that you really do dedicate yourself to spending the necessary time getting period 8 ready. Cool. Let's get cracking. Uh, domestic policy-wise, some big ideas to start with. A uh, big question about the role of government. Uh, throughout the uh, period, time of period 8 from 1945 all the way to 1980 in Reagan's election. And for the video's sake, I'm going to go into period 9 as well, so through Reagan's presidency. A big question about the role of government. Should the government be liberal and big and wide and take care of people's needs or should it be more conservative? Right? Small government, small spending, tight interpretation. Uh, we'll talk post-war economy, uh, why the U.S. doesn't tumble back into the Great Depression. Uh, we'll talk first, oh, excuse me, second Red Scare. Uh, we'll talk civil rights movement. Uh, as well as the other protest movements and this new left. Uh, we'll talk Great Society of LBJ's presidency and then starting with Nixon on out to Reagan, uh, the new federalism of back to states' rights, smaller central government, and so forth. So uh, late 40s, 1950s, economically speaking, um, I spelled this wrong, that's my bad, guys. Um, we are going to see a huge continuation of spending, right? The U.S. is spending a ton of money, governmentally speaking, uh, through the New Deal, right? The Keynesian economics of deficit spending uh, through World War II, the most expensive time period in American history. Uh, and the real reason that the U.S. doesn't fall back into a recession or a depression is this continued spending. Uh, a couple of things you should note, uh, the GI Bill, uh, which allows for those coming back from World War II, um, to have access to education for free, to home loans, to business loans, so they can real, really assimilate themselves back into the economy so you don't end up with a, a bonus army situation again. Uh, I really do see an economic boom post-war. Our, our country's econo uh, econo economy is thriving. A lot of that's due to war spending, defense spending, uh, but also the fact that the rest of the world is, is recovering and we're not. Uh, so the U.S. does have a real good economic role. Uh, we see a huge growth of, of migration to the Sun Belt, these southern states, Florida, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, even California, as companies are going to move there uh, because of lower tax rates as uh, the South tries to uh, attract capital and industry finally into their region. Uh, and we're going to see a huge growth in suburbanization as people are leaving cities, uh, moving to the suburbs, um, and we'll get into that a little bit as well. Now, uh, Truman, of course, is president because uh, he was FDR's vice president for FDR's fourth term, and FDR died. Uh, so Truman is president for the rest of FDR's term, and then he wins one very close election on his own. But his domestic policy is going to be called the fair deal, right? So it's not, not the square deal, not the new deal. It's the fair deal. And he wants to extend Social Security to include more people. He wants to increase minimum wage. Uh, he wants to create a national health insurance policy so the whole country has health insurance. And what he's really asking to do is to continue and grow some New Deal policies. But what was okay um, for FDR to do, because it was the Great Depression and we were like, whatever it takes, uh, he's going to run up against a bunch of conservative backlash, uh, largely the Southern Democrats, 
who are going to say, nope, that's too much government. That's too much uh, social change. That's too much welfare uh, because we're no longer in a Great Depression. We don't have to do such drastic stuff. Uh, so Truman's fair deal, he's, he's going to see an increase in the minimum wage, but a lot of his other uh, agenda items aren't going to pass because of conservatives that are blocking much of his policies. Uh, under him, we see the desegregation of the armed forces, which is a big deal. Uh, now our military uh, is not segregated into black and white units. Uh, and under his presidency, under his domestic policy, we have Congress reducing the power of unions. Really, to me, this is a, a similarity between uh, post World War One and post World War Two is that we're hesitant and a little bit worried about unions uh, with the Taft Hartley Act, which I might add Truman vetoes, but Congress passes over his veto because they have enough votes. Uh, under Truman, we, we we tumble into our second Red Scare, uh, which is very similar to post World War One. Uh, we create the Federal Employee Loyalty Program to make sure that federal government employees are, are loyal to the country. Uh, being loyal and being very pro-America, we have the House of Representatives creating the House Un-American Activities Committee, which is investigating corruption and communism in the State Department and elsewhere. Uh, we see blacklisting, in which uh, actors and actresses and musicians that are, are thought to be loyal to communism in Hollywood are are kept from from producing movies and and getting jobs in in entertainment. Uh, we do have a couple examples of people. Uh, Alger Hiss is one who goes to jail for being disloyal, and Ethel and Julius Rosenberg uh, are actually caught selling state secrets and put to death. So there are some examples of, of, of communist infiltration to our system, but it's never nearly as bad as Joseph McCarthy would have you believe. Now, McCarthy is a, a junior congressman, uh, and, and he is going to really gain a ton of fame for uh, McCarthyism, right? This this idea of a huge witch hunt for communists. He's famous for standing in front of the government and saying, "I have in my hand right here a list of such and such amount of card carrying communists that are working in our State Department." Now, of course, he's making the whole thing up. Uh, he eventually loses his credibility as he attacks the military, uh, and he finally fades from the public's eye and turns to alcoholism and dies very early from liver failure. Uh, but you know, it goes to show don't don't lie to the American people and then go home and drink a lot of whiskey. Um, but it's important that we understand that McCarthy really is symbolic for what the Red Scare is. It's just Americans believing anything and restricting civil liberties for anything is because of, oh my God, the communists are coming. Uh, there's a great cartoon that you guys had in class that you should reference in which uh, the House Un-American Committee's uh, car is running people off the road and the guy driving says, it's okay, we can do whatever we want, we're, we're chasing communists. So this idea that people are so worried about communists that they're willing to just give away their civil rights as well. Now, after Truman comes uh, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, he is the first Republican president since the 1920s, uh, our good friend Ho -ho Hoover. Um, my kids will get that joke. Um, and he is a, a moderate. He's not a super far conservative, farther far right president, but his vice president is. Uh, Richard Nixon is his vice president, and Richard Nixon is known as being a really harsh, strong uh, uh, big-minded anti-communist, and Eisenhower is, is more more down the middle, uh, more of a moderate. Uh, in his words, he considers himself economically conservative but socially liberal. So he's conservative when it comes to money, but social, but liberal when it comes to humans and human policies. And he does really back that up. Uh, under him, we see the passage and uh, creation of the Interstate Highway Act, which I would argue is just as significant. Uh, as the transcontinental railroad completion in terms of connecting our country economically, demographically, and socially. Um, it's passed, of course, uh, with de national defense-mindedness uh, in that case so we can get our stuff, our missiles, our troops, or whatever from uh, east coast to west coast and vice versa. In that case, it's motivated in a very similar way to the Panama Canal under Teddy. Uh, but it's going to create a bunch of jobs along the highways, a bunch of suburbs, a bunch of ability to travel. People can go, the idea of road trips are created. The idea of motels that are chains that are along the highways all over the, all the world, just it comes out of this idea. Uh, under Eisenhower, we really do see the rise of the middle class as well. Uh, under Eisenhower's presidency, for the first time in American history, we have more white-collar workers, so more business workers than blue-collar, than more manual labor workers. And under him, we see this growth of suburbanization, that Americans are leaving the cities and leaving rural areas and settling in suburbs. Uh, in these suburbs, we really do see 
uh, conformity. All the houses look the same. All the families look the same. All the cars look the same. Uh, we see the baby boom really driving the suburbanization as uh, all these military vets are coming home and having families. Um, we see the use of credit cards first in the 1950s, which drives consumerism, which is going to be very similar to what happens in the 1920s. As, as, as TV becomes for the 1950s, what radio was for the 1920s, in that it's the thing everybody has to have, it's the thing that drives advertising, and it's the thing that drives culture. Uh, and with that, like I said, TV is going to really breed conformity. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, another important aspect of Eisenhower's domestic policy comes with what he does on the way out. Now, his, his farewell address is, one of the, in my opinion, one of the more influential uh, speeches of the 20th century uh, and that he warns America that they're becoming so their their military and their industrial abilities have become so intertwined because of World War II and the Cold War that our entire industrial capacity is being wrapped up in military stuff. He's arguing that our, our sciences are all for the military, that our industry is all for the military, that our progress is all for the military and he warns America like it, it if we keep going down this path, we're going to turn into one of those crazy military totalitarian industrial regimes that we're so worried about overseas. And it, it really is an impactful speech that is eye-opening in terms of what happens with our country's spending in the next 30 years. He was actually quite correct. Now, uh, domestically speaking, from a culture standpoint, we have two important groups we need to understand in the 1950s. The first is the group of conformity. Uh, it's really going to be driven by TV shows that are that are showing domesticity, uh, women. Uh, this is the time period in which women are really reinforced in that ideals from the 1820s and 30s of the cult of domesticity. Stay home. Take care of the kids. That's your domain. Do everything you should there. But advertising is going to reinforce this. And we see advertising for, for kitchen appliances and for clothes, and it really is reinforcing this role of, of women as mother, as wife, and as cook and cleaner, and chef, and home. Um, we see TV shows that are really reinforcing suburbia, right? Um, uh, we see advertising, like you guys saw in class, for that Know Your Role for Women advertisement. So we see, through our, our mass media, this reinforcement of gender roles that really takes a step back for women. Uh, we see white-collar work and business dress codes, that men are all going to work in the same kinds of offices. They're wearing the exact same clothes. They all look the same. They all have the same haircut. They all have the same car. Uh, conformity is also really driven by church membership. Uh, we see a huge spike in, in church membership, specifically for Christianity in the 1950s. Uh, and the 1950s is also when we add under God to the Pledge of Allegiance and in God we trust to uh, the money. So uh, our culture is really driven through, through work, through TV, through religion, uh, and through conformity. And it all really is starting to look the same. Uh, our music is conformist and the, the doo-wop style of music uh, with, with white people snapping around and, and, and looking foolish. Uh, and it's also important to understand that the 50s are really driven by consumerism and by the automobile. Uh, as Americans are buying bigger cars and, and fancier cars and TVs and appliances, and the standard of living does really raise in the 1950s, which is important because this is the generation that just came out of the Great Depression and then the rationing, terrible home front life of World War II. Now, there is some opposition to this 1950s culture. The most well-known that you should know is the Beatnik or the Beat Movement. Uh, they're going to be more champions of a freer lifestyle to reject the conformity of the 50s to live your own lifestyle, to pursue your own happiness, not get wrapped up in what society says you should do. Uh, people you should know, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, both, both authors that are, are questioning the established authority. A uh, really important book that I thought I should mention because it's a book that a lot of people read in high school, uh, and it's Catcher in the Rye, uh, in which this individual is just really questioning like all of the conformity and the, ha the apparent surf superficial happiness around him. And he's really struggling with some internal demons as he looks at the world um, not through the rose-colored glasses that everybody else is looking at the world through. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, also published in this time period. And I would argue that To Kill a Mockingbird is a foundational argument against the conformity of society. Uh, so that all kind of ties in with our, our beat or our beatnik movement. Uh, this way of thinking and this lifestyle is going to end up planting the seeds for what will be the counterculture hippie movement in the 1960s. Uh, we also see in our music, though, 
uh, some questioning of authority through rock and roll and people like Elvis um, that are, aren't that are the, the women and the mothers are terrified. Oh my, our kids can't listen to this terrible music. It's going to pervert them. Elvis is out here gyrating his hips. It's all sorts of bad. Uh, but the music begins to start breaking out of the box in the 1950s. Uh, other people that we should know who are opposing 1950s conformity, Betty Friedan, uh, her super important book, The Feminine Mystique. Can't spell, I apologize. Feminine Mystique, uh, which argues that women have more out there than just living in a suburb, raising kids, and waiting for their husband to come home. Uh, she's really going to be groundbreaking in her push for women's rights. And we also see a couple important books that publish uh, this idea of other Americas, that not everybody's successful and happy and conformist over here. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith is going to uh, write The Affluent Society, which is going to play a huge role in the domestic policies of both JFK and LBJ as they try to address poverty. And he's arguing that, that much like what we've seen in other areas of American history, how the other half lives, for example, uh, when America gets richer, America also gets poorer. Another important author of another America type of book is Michael Harrington, who publishes The Other America, which is a very similar to how the other half lives type look at rural and urban poverty in America. Now, in the 50s, we also see the foundation of the civil rights movement getting its restart, trying to cash in on the promises of Reconstruction, with World War II really as the foundational piece that restarts the civil rights movement. Uh, during World War II, I told you in the last video, we see the creation of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, we see a huge increase in membership in the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People during World War II. Uh, and then we see the desegregation of military industries by FDR and the desegregation of the military itself by Truman, followed by Brown versus Board of Education, of course, in 1954, which rules uh, overrules Plessy versus Ferguson and it rules that separate but equal is unconstitutional. Now you can't just change the South with the court case as we know or, or the North for that matter uh, and we see the creation of the Southern Manifesto in which over a hundred Southern congressmen are going to sign a petition that basically says we don't really care what Brown versus Board says we're not desegregating our schools. That of course is tested with the Little Rock Nine in which Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas is going to uh, send his state's National Guardsmen to make sure that schools don't get integrated. And here is where we see Eisenhower really rise to the challenge uh, and send the 51st Airborne uh, to Little Rock to force the Little Rock schools to integrate. That's a huge win for civil rights and school desegregation, but what does Little Rock as a school district do the next year? Instead of simply integrating, they just close their schools for a year. So, a long way to go on that front. Uh, also in the 50s, we see Rosa Parks and the Montgomery Bus Boycott, which really is the beginnings of Martin Luther King Jr. as a civil rights uh, organizer and leader. Uh, and we see the beginnings of SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, that's where we'll see King Jr. playing a huge role in things like the Montgomery Bus Boycott, as well as SNCC. A uh, very important ground-up organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, beginning their sit-ins in the late 50s, early 60s in places like Greensboro, North Carolina, at lunch counters. So that's it for the 50s in Eisenhower. Uh, we're going to see JFK getting elected in 1960, defeating Nixon, of course, who was Eisenhower's vice president, in what some would consider a moderate upset. Uh, but really, we can thank TV for that. Uh, Nixon is an ugly man. And JFK is not an ugly man. And in their televised debates, uh, Nixon looks uh, disheveled and sweaty and unprepared. And Kennedy looks smooth and, and presidential, you would say. Uh, and K uh, Kennedy wins the election, which then ends the one Republican president that we have all the way through the 40s, 50s, 60s, until we get to Nixon in 68. Now, Kennedy's domestic policy is going to be called the New Frontier. He wants to take America to a new place of progress, then with education, with health care progress, with civil rights progress, with progress progress, um, just in general societal progress. But a bunch of his ideas of progress are again blocked by Congress. We still see this voting block of Southern Democrats who are conservative and anti-big government, anti-progress, but don't worry, they'll leave the Democratic Party Soon. Uh, the famous line that really best encompasses this idea of the new frontier, 
uh, is Kennedy saying that we will put a man on the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And that really sums up this idea of what the new frontier is. It's facing challenges and bringing America to those challenges. Um, and of course, he also creates the Peace Corps, a very important example of having volunteers sign up to go spread goodwill to underdeveloped countries with service projects. Um, and then he dies. Uh, he gone. Uh, November 22 of 1963, he is assassinated in Dallas. And LBJ, his vice president, takes over and has a much more significant impact domestically uh, than Kennedy does. Now, Kennedy has some important stuff foreign policy-wise that's worth noting. But, of course, uh, you'll have to check the foreign policy period 8 video to get those juicy details. Now, LBJ, of course, background-wise, is a New Deal Democrat. So he's a Southern Democrat, but he's not a Southern Democrat in terms of like states' rights. He's a Southern Democrat in terms of like uh, the New Deal, big government, huge FDR fan. Uh, and his domestic policy is called the Great Society. Uh, very, very important. One of my favorite uh, collectively put together uh, eras of legislation in American history. But what it does is a huge, huge, huge increase in the government's role. Massive amounts of what we would consider today liberalism. Uh, it's very similar to the New Deal in that it's just the creation of a bunch of agencies to try to fix society's problems. Uh, so it's a sil similar in that respect in that it's going to use the federal government as the lever to fix society. Uh, but it's different from the New Deal in that it actually faces civil rights, whereas FDR's New Deal largely ignored African Americans. The big platforms that uh, LBJ wants to fix in his great society is immigration, civil rights, uh, education, old people, uh, and poverty in general. So, uh, worth noting, programs and accomplishments of the Great Society. Um, of course, LBJ has to run for president one year after he took office because uh, that was the end of Kennedy's term. Uh, he runs against a conservative from Arizona, Barry Goldwater. Uh, and it's a real big statement election. Uh, LBJ wins significantly. It's a mandate election. The Americans have spoken. They are on board with LBJ's domestic policy of progress and liberalism in great society. Uh, a couple of things that are programs or accomplishments worth noting of the great society. He creates the Office of Economic Opportunity. Through that, we see Head Start, uh, uh, preschool programs for areas in which kids often start behind academically, a super big deal that, that carries on today, um, which, which leads to better education. He also creates the Job Corps, which is a series of trainings and resources for those who are after high school age to get better job training so they can move up without education in their life. Uh, pushes a bunch of literacy programs to really just improve education in our society. Um, he is the first president to push for federal funding of education instead of just state funding, uh, which is very important. But, you know, his first job is as a teacher in rural Texas, so he understands the challenges of education in America. Also super, super important uh, with legacies to today, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which 40 years later gets rid of those quotas from the 1920s which limit immigration from places like Asia, Southeast Europe, and the Middle East, etc. So our first real big immigration reform policy uh, post-first Red Scare. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, so health care for old people, and health care for people who qualify for food stamps as well. So a bunch of support for the elderly, a bunch of support for the poor. Um, so these together are really just part of his, his big push for the war on poverty to lift society up with the federal government's help. Uh, food stamps I mentioned, as well as federal national government's money for education and for public housing. Um, in this time period, we really see the increase of what FDR started with the welfare state, with the federal government taking care of people. Uh, critics would argue that the Great Society was too expensive, it was inefficient, it didn't spend its money smart, it was too idealistic, it was too beautiful in its ideas but not in its practice. Uh, and the always the complaint against uh, welfare programs is that they create dependency. Uh, they allow people to then just rely too much on the government and less on themselves. Uh, also L under LBJ we see some really, really, really important civil rights movement foundational events. Uh, we see the Freedom Rides, which you guys read about in class, uh, these protests against the segregation of the bus system. Uh, they are successful despite in, in desegregating the bus system, despite uh, violence and intimidation on the way. Uh, we see the Birmingham, Birmingham campaign by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, 
uh, trying to force the desegregation of the city of Birmingham, uh, which is the center of race violence and, and lynching and clan violence and church bombings in the South. Um, it's out of this Birmingham campaign where we have MLK's super influential and famous uh, letter from a Birmingham jail in which he outlines the goals of the civil rights movement as being nonviolent but, but patient and long-term. Um, we had the March on Washington in 1963, which is still, of course, under JFK's presidency, in which hundreds of thousands of, of African-American and other race people uh, come together in Washington, D.C. to demand action from the government. Uh, that's what finally gets JFK to promise to move on civil rights and to push Congress on civil rights. Uh, of course, JFK dies shortly after, but in his legacy, LBJ and Congress act to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the, really the first significant nationwide civil rights legislation since Reconstruction, uh, which made it illegal to segregate in any and all public facilities and created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission which outlawed any sort of discrimination uh, in employment. So no segregation in public facilities and no, no discrimination based on race for employment. But, 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 the uh, Civil Rights Movement says this is not enough. We don't just need an act outlawing segregation. We need a political voice. We need to have protected our right to vote. Uh, the 24th Amendment is ratified, which outlaws poll taxes. Super important. The fact that they're still being used in 1960s is disgusting to me. Uh, and we see the Freedom Summer, in which all kinds of activists are going into the rural South, dangerous, some of them dying in the process, to help African Americans get registered to vote. Uh, and the final real straw to get LBJ and Congress on board is the Selma to Montgomery March, which, as you guys should know, ends in really terrible violence the first time in which even a, a white priest from Boston who's there to show his support gets killed in the process uh, and then a more successful Selma to Montgomery march in which LBJ sends federal troops to make sure the march is safe uh, followed by the Voting Rights Act of 1965 which in my particular opinion is one of the most important pieces of legislation in the 20th century. Uh, the Voting Rights Act ends voting discrimination. It makes it a federal crime to restrict voting privileges privileges, and it bans literacy tests. And the fact that those are still being used in the 1960s is also disgusting. However, at this point, uh, LBJ thinks he's done enough for civil rights, and he has done a ton for civil rights, but we still see a ton of black unrest, particularly in urban areas. Uh, we have the Watts riots of 1965, Chicago riots as well, uh, and we see the black civil rights movement splitting uh, into a more militant branch uh, of like the Malcolm X's uh, Stokely Carmichael's Black Power, Black Panthers, which are more aggressive in their desire and their push for rights versus the MLKs um, and the like who, who are still uh, desiring a more peaceful approach. Now, the 60s also see a huge growth of protest. Uh, the 60s are a time of great social and civil unrest. A lot of it is driven by the civil rights movement, but a lot of it is also driven by the Vietnam War. Um, we see Vietnam protests in, in every city. They're protesting the draft. They're protesting what they see as an unfair war. They're protesting a war that has not been declared by Congress. There's a lot of protest movement in the 60s uh, that's driven by Vietnam. We also see on college campuses this intertwining of anti-war and also just free speech movement. We see the creation of the Students for a Democratic Society, uh, which you definitely should know, uh, and their desires. If you guys read in class, if you remember, uh, they, they're saying the thing that woke us up from our, our conformity, from our, our slumber, was the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and this new liberal, new left movement that's really in favor of, of liberal, liberalism and progress on college campuses. Uh, we see Betty Friedan and women uh, protesting for their rights with the National Organization of Women and their desire for the Equal Rights Amendment being ratified by the states. Of course, as you guys know, unsuccessfully. Uh, we see the Stonewall riots after a big massacre of, of, of gay people in New York, uh, which really starts the, the gay rights movement as well, uh, which is a, a, a voice of protest. And the year 1968, as well as the election 1968, really does signify the apex of this protest movement. 68 sees MLK uh, shot and killed, leading to a ton of riots in Washington, D.C. and Memphis, where he's killed. Uh, we see Robert F. Kennedy Jr. assassinated uh, while running for president. Really, the country has fallen into a massive amount of, of upheaval and chaos. Uh, 
even there are even huge riots at the Democratic Convention as the Democratic Party splits over who to nominate for president over the Vietnam War issue, really. We see George Wallace, who, who you guys know, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, uh, running for president and winning multiple states. And eventually Richard Nixon comes out of this election as the voice of moderation and the voice of stability. So he's going to take us into the 1970s. And the 1970s, as you guys know, because we just covered this a couple weeks ago, domestically, really just is a time of, of ugliness for America, both domestically and foreign policy-wise. Nobody trusts the government. Um, the Pentagon Papers come out that show how shady the Vietnam War has been. Kennedy try Kennedy, excuse me, Kennedy's dead. Uh, Nixon tries to keep them from coming out. Uh, he tries to keep the New York Times from publishing them. In New York Times versus the United States, the New York Times is granted the right to publish these papers, which make the government look really bad. You trust the government less. The vice president has to resign his office because of tax evasion. Trust the government more. Congress passes the War Powers Act, which, which shows that Congress no longer trusts whoever is president to conduct the Vietnam War honorably. Uh, it basically overrides that Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Um, but really, the 70s are a time of more limited government after the liberalism of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s of new federalism. Federalism, of course, is the way power is shared between the federal and the state governments. In this case, new federalism is shifting power back to the states. Uh, now, one important accomplishment of the 1970s, uh, legislatively speaking, is the creation of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which comes after Rachel Carson's Silent Spring book, a good example of 1970s muckraking. So uh, Nixon helps create the Environmental Protection Agency. Very, very important. I will happily give him credit for that. Uh, but Nixon also has to resign for Watergate uh, for covering up the crime of breaking into his political opponent's campaign headquarters to try to steal secrets. Uh, the 70s are a time of stagflation, as we see a ton of inflation and in cost, but stagnation in wages. So our economic situation, we have no oil, thanks to OPEC. Um, the 70s are, are a big, big struggle domestically. There are a couple of exciting things. For women, we have Title IX, which uh, outlaws discrimination in college facilities, uh, which is a, a big win for women's rights, as well as Roe v. Wade, uh, passed in 1970, Supreme Court ruled in 1973 that the that abortion was not illegal and therefore legal. However, in the 1970s, we also see the defeat of the Equal Rights Amendment from conservatives as well as women like Phyllis Shafley, oh Phyllis, uh, who argue that women don't need the, the Equal Rights Amendment because it will keep them from enjoying their role as happy housewives. Uh, under the 70s, we see the creation of the American Indian Movement, a more militant group pushing for uh, recognition and rights for American Indians as well as here at the tail end of the 70s, uh, University of California Regents versus Backey, a, a Supreme Court case that upholds affirmative action, but it also rules that you can't let people into college and therefore into any opportunity in life simply because of their race. Race can just be one qualifier, uh, not the only qualifier. So uh, it's important also as well to hit both of these Supreme Court uh, eras, the Warren Court, uh, Earl Warren from 53 to 69, some of our most important Supreme Court cases in American history. Uh, Brown versus Board, we already covered, very important uh, in terms of school desegregation and really the, the launch point of the civil rights movement. Uh, we see Yates versus the United States, uh, a less known but important case, which ruled that the First Amendment protects any speech, even if it is radical or revolutionary. So that would then uh, side with people like Eugene Debs, for example, from World War I. Uh, MAP versus Ohio, which is huge for rights of the accused, which says that any evidence that's seized illegally uh, can't be used in court. So it's good for the accused. Uh, Engel versus Vitel rules that you can't require public prayer in a public school, uh, a win for civil liberties in terms of separating church and state. Uh, Griswold v. Connecticut uh, ruled that citizens have the right to privacy, and what they do in their own personal sexual lives is private. And therefore, a state cannot outlaw or prohibit birth control pills or any sort of birth control. Uh, another win for freedom of expression, if you will. Uh, and then Miranda versus Arizona, which ruled that um, you have the right to remain silent and have an attorney anytime you are arrested. But it's important we identify the Warren Court with a more loose interpretation of the Constitution. 
and liberal pushing the progress ideas. Uh, after foreign court is the Burger Court. Burger is uh, appointed by Nixon, and he's not a conservative court era, but it's more transitional. It's in between. Uh, they are conservative on some items and uh, more liberal on others. They're liberal in the case of Roe v. Wade and New York Times versus the United States, for example, in terms of allowing for the freedom of the press and the freedom to choose for women. Uh, they're also moderately liberal in terms of Lemon versus Kurtzman. Uh, in this case, it's not really important for APUSH, but it is for APGov. It's called the Lemon Test. In this case, uh, states can't reimburse private Catholic schools for the salary of their teachers because that would be a violation of the church and state. Uh, U.S. versus Nixon. The Supreme Court rules against Nixon. and says he has to turn over all of his stuff uh, leading to Watergate. And then UC versus Backey. I already talked about dealing with um, affirmative action in University of California. Cool. So that uh, the chaos of, of the 60s and the ugliness of the 70s leads to conservatism uh, in the 60s uh, I'm sorry, in the 80s. And there's roots of conservatism that's kind of always been there. Uh, Barry Goldwater, I talked about, election eight, 1964. This push to get away from New Deal liberalism and great society liberalism. These conservatives are going to be anti-abortion, anti-sexual revolution, anti-gay rights, anti-affirmative action, anti-anti-war protest. So they're anti-protest. Uh, an anti-drug culture and use. And they're going to be pro, in their words, family values, religious Christian values, Work ethic, which is a code word for uh, no government handouts because they're not working hard enough. Uh, and pro-national security. Right? We put up those slides, if you guys remember, right at the very tail end of content in which I showed you the modern Republican Party and really is this. Uh, they're going to be backed by the moral majority, this group arguing to put morals back in American government and the religious right, the religious conservatives. And the election of 1980 really does prove this with the election of Reagan and his conservatism. Now, Reagan's domestic policy is going to be opposed to big government. Uh, he's going to stop all kinds of federal government programs or cut uh, financially federal government programs uh, that deal with liberalism and handouts and, and progress uh, with what's called supply side or Reaganomics economics, uh, which is in a sense a huge tax cut, especially if you're rich, you pay less taxes, and then that extra money will trickle down to the rest of society. But when it doesn't trickle down and the government doesn't have as much money because the taxes aren't being collected as much, and then the government can look back and say, well, sorry, we got to cut those programs because there's no money. Um, also huge on deregulation because, again, that shrinks the size of the government if you don't need to have government regulators running around checking on things. Um, but in typical Republican fashion, which Reagan certainly is, we see a huge increase in defense spending, which then means there's no balanced budget. Because you're cutting taxes on one side, but you're not cutting spending on the biggest chunk of spending, defense spending. So our government deficits blow up or go way, way higher. Uh, also on Reagan, we see uh, the war on drugs and the criminalization of, of a lot of uh, urban activities. Uh, the criminalization of, of marijuana and crack cocaine, specifically the three strikes rule. We see Nancy Reagan with her awesome strategy of just say no. I don't know why I didn't try that. Um, and we also see AIDS, the AIDS epidemic and outbreak, and Reagan and his government's lack of response to it. A big long-term legacy of Reagan, uh, besides uh, Reaganomics, uh, is that he appoints some real staunch conservatives to the Supreme Court. Uh, and with that, we see the Supreme Court ruling in a much more tight, strict interpretation, allowing states to have some restrictions on abortion. Uh, and reducing the benefits of affirmative action. So it's important you guys understand that Reagan simply is a response to the, the chaos and liberalism of the 60s and the, and the ugly lack of progress in the 70s, uh, bringing back American traditional conservative moral pride. Now, uh, after Reagan, just so that you have a couple things in your back pocket just in case, uh, we see Daddy Bush. Uh, Daddy Bush... Um, George H.W. Bush, George Bush Sr. Uh, under him, we have the a, a win, the American with Disabilities Act, which allows forces public facilities to be uh, dis disability accessible. For example, this is why we have ramps uh, on our sidewalk corners so that wheelchairs can get up and down. Uh, under him, of course, because we have a recession. Why do we have a recession? Because we just did tax cuts. We always have a recession after tax cuts but they don't listen to me on financial policies. Um, so he has four terms. I'm sorry, excuse me. No, only FDR has four terms. He has four years, and he is vote, he's, uh, beaten four years later by 
Bill Clinton. Uh, under Clinton, we see the boom of the internet. Uh, we see the creation of NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement, which gets rid of any tariffs or trade barriers in us and North America, so Mexico and Canada. So really a push towards a more globalized economy. Uh, and of course, under him, we see the impeachment of Clinton for lying under oath about uh, a variety of things of a sexual nature. Uh, Baby Bush comes to office after eight years of Clinton. Under him, we see a couple of really important domestic events. Uh, one is No Child Left Behind, which, in my opinion, fully ruins the education system in America. Under him, we see Hurricane Katrina and a lot of criticism for the government for not responding enough to the citizens of New Orleans, who are under one of the worst hurricanes in human history. Uh, we see 9-11 uh, under George W. Bush, uh, Baby Bush. Uh, and with it, uh, with 9-11, the War on Terror and the Patriot Act, uh, which makes it legal to uh, basically spy on our electronic communications, our cell phones, our internet usage, etc., as a means to cut down on terror. Uh, it's going to be very similar to like uh, an espionage, espionage and sedition act during World War I. Uh, we see Bush. What does he do? He reduces taxes. And what happens on his way out of office? Another recession. This one, our biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression, uh, which leaves our final president to cover, uh, Barack Obama, to deal with the Great Recession. And what does he? how does he deal with it? Much like FDR, through Keynesian economics, government spending to bail out the country. Uh, his is called the American Recovery and Investment Act. It bails out the auto industries in Detroit. Uh, it's a ton of government spending to try to get the economy back on its feet. And, and slowly and steadily, the American economy does recover for the following six years of his presidency. Uh, under him, we also see the push towards... Uh, making sure all Americans have health insurance through Obamacare, uh, which has some successes and some shortcomings, but the number of Americans who are uninsured is now uh, at, a, at a very low rate. And under Obama, we also overturn the policy of don't ask, don't tell, which uh, ke kept uh, people who are gay from being openly gay and in the military. Uh, so that just about does it for all of our domestic policies. As always, if you have any questions, please write them down, take note. And I'll be happy to work uh, through them with you in our next class. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys soon.